Um, so hello everyone uh, and welcome to this this taster session on uh, on South Asia on South Asian languages and cultures um, and particularly as part of our uh, BA degrees in languages and cultures. My name is Dr David Lung um, I teach in the School of Languages and Cultures and Linguistics um, um, particularly in the South Asia section uh, and I teach literature, um, occasionally language, cinema um, the, and the kind of cultural studies of South Asia um, alongside post-colonial studies. My own focus is on Hindi and Urdu. Um, and so it's a great pleasure that as part of today's session, we'll also be having a, a kind of language taster on Hindi and Urdu from our senior lecturer in Hindi and Urdu, Naresh Sharma. Um, and as a man said, uh, we have a student here with us today, Farah Qureshi, um, who will be able to answer any questions you have about studying at SOAS more generally. Um, so I'll just start sharing my screen and hopefully this will work with no problems. Um, so I'm hoping you can see that. Um, so I, the kind of I outline um, for today is that we'll have a sort of short talk from me on some of the things you can, some of the ways we, we study South Asia at SOAS, some of the ways we think about it, and particularly within the context of the degree program that we offer. Um, and I'll speak for about 10 or 12 minutes, I think. Um, and then we'll have this, this Hindi Urdu language taster from Naresh. And then we'll open it up to a kind of question and answer session. So any any questions you might have about studying um, at SOAS, studying South Asia in particular, uh, we welcome those uh, and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Um, so what do we mean when we when we think about studying South Asia, particularly through this lens of what we call languages and cultures? Um, obviously South Asia is a is a enormous and diverse region. And when we're speaking about it, we're speaking about India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Bhutan, right? Um, and when we when we try to approach a region as diverse as South Asia, um, there's multiple ways we can try and do it, right? We can view it through disciplinary lenses, for instance, like history or politics or the study of religion. Um, or we can do it through uh, and the kind of model that we try and push here, which is a very interdisciplinary model, right? And what do we mean by that? We mean trying to take as broad a kind of perspective on the region as is possible. Um, so in depth, yes, um, and intense in many ways, uh, but also trying to think what insights can we gain on a place as complex and as interesting and as rich as South Asia um, when we bring different kinds of perspectives to bear, right? Cultural studies, historical studies, uh, and these kinds of things. Um, but then a crucial feature of the way we approach it through this BA languages and cultures, well, there are two crucial features. And um, the first is that we very, very strongly believe in the value of studying language. And um, that's kind of one of the things that makes SOAS so unique. And um, we really uh, are convinced that if you want to study um, places like South Asia um, or anywhere else uh, in the world, it's absolutely vital uh, that you can approach these places uh, with that kind of knowledge and the insights gained through studying language. Um, so that's a kind of key feature of how we, we try to train you and try to, to, to educate you and, and, and to construct our degree. Um, and the other kind of key feature is to think about South, South Asia not as somewhere there, not as an object simply to be studied um, from a distance, and not as somewhere bounded and unconnected to the rest of the world, but in fact quite the opposite, and to think of it um, in its multiple connections, right, um, as part of a world that really changes when we start viewing it from uh, different perspectives. If we start thinking about the world from South Asia, from Asia, from Africa, from the Middle East, rather than sitting in London, which of course we are, um, and viewing it as something distant um, and other and strange. And that's a kind of key, um, and I think really vital part of the degree uh, that we, the way we, we try and approach it here. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit, I'll be talking a little bit in a few minutes um, about the kinds of uh, modules that really emphasize this question of interconnectedness, right, about a world um, that is perhaps far more, uh, yes, interconnected than we, we would regularly appreciate um, and regularly think of, right. Um, so we move beyond what has been a kind of traditional area studies model, um, which is focusing, as I said, on a particular region in isolation, and really to think about it um, in these kind of connected 
connected ways. And I, I do believe that, you know, SOAS is um, the best and possibly the only place to come and do this kind of study. And so I very much encourage you to consider coming along to do it. Now, this is a kind of a graphic that I find um, quite, quite provocative when we think about connections, right? When we, when we think about the kind of way in which different worlds connect. This is a, something produced by Facebook in, in 2010. Um, and it mirrors, but also doesn't mirror in some ways, the other kinds of maps that are produced all over the world. Um, you can see this kind of huge amount of light in this representation in certain parts of the globe, particularly North America and Europe. Um, but as they draw these sort of very fine blue lines across the map, they are trying to emphasize, they were trying to emphasize and demonstrate the kinds of ways in which people connect through social media and Facebook in particular. Um, and when we look at things like this, we're very tempted to think, right, this is a kind of particular um, element of our kind of contemporary world, right? We live in this hyper-connected age. Uh, we are more connected than we have ever been before. And this is a result of lots of things, right? This is a result of technology. This is a result of modernity. This is a result um, in some ways of the kinds of connections wrought by a history of European colonialism and imperial expansion and um, uh, mercantilism and capitalism and all the rest of it, right? So there's lots of ways in which we can think about the histories of uh, connections. And so as I kind of go through this, I want to sort of pick up, you know, three little case studies that perhaps invite us to think about South Asia and inv invite us to think about the world in slightly, in slightly different terms. Um, one of these is to kind of think through ideas of what I'm calling connections before colonialism. So if we think of that period of European colonialism in the 18th and 19th centuries in particular, um, coming to a kind of end, a formal end perhaps in the period after the Second World War, um, we still live in the legacy in many ways of uh, that period. And one of the, the legacies, one of the kind of things that conditions us uh, as a result of of uh, the, the era of European expansion and colonialism is this idea of what we call Eurocentrism, right? Which is a, a kind of approach that puts Europe at the center of the world. And that's perhaps most obvious when we think of maps, right? When we look at a map, we are constantly, we see Europe in the middle, right? And everything to the left and to the right and to the east and to the west, Europe, on the north at the top of the map. But what happens, and you can see it, I hope, in the, in the kind of image up here on the right, what happens when we turn that upside down? Even here, we've still got Europe in the center, but we're now got Europe on the bottom. What happens when we take those kinds of slightly discomforting steps and try, start to imagine our world somewhat differently or entirely differently? What do you think when you look at a piece of a, an image like that. And when you compare it then to maps, and you can see it at the bottom of the screen there, um, this one uh, from the, what was called the, it was the Imperial Federation of 1886. And you can see those kind of pink, red shaded areas. Uh, of course, the kind of height of Victorian Britain and that slogan, the sun never sets on the British Empire, a kind of way of represent. So the way we represent the world, the way we picture it really does matter when we think about um, all the kinds of, other issues that have come to condition how we approach places like South Asia, right? Um, two of those are this idea of colonialism on the one hand and Orientalism on the other. What do we mean by Orientalism? This kind of will to stereotype, this will uh, to um, view other parts of the world as Oriental, therefore exotic, um, as strange, but also as inferior. Um, a kind of legacy of empire that was built on the idea of a European supremacy, a European dominance, and the naturalness of this. And we are very much invested in disturbing that pattern, right? In, in, in what in today's terms, decolonizing the kind of knowledge production that surrounds um, the way we approach the rest of the world, right? Um, so although we have this sort of school of Oriental and African studies as our former uh, official name, we're very much not invested in these ideas of Orientalism, but in fact of overturning them entirely and thinking about the world in more equal uh, terms. 
And this kind of Eurocentrism really does appear sort of everywhere and can appear in sort of issues like time. You know, when we talk about the common era, when we talk about modernity, um, we are, again, things that we maybe not think of as having this um, European origin, but are in fact deeply implicated in the ways uh, we view the world. Um, and so we come to this question of the hyperconnected world and what it looks like when we look from somewhere else. And this matters when we come to think about things like language. We think about languages that travel and we think about what constitutes a global language and we immediately turn to English as that kind of global language par excellence. But what happens when we think about um, languages and the kind of language worlds uh, from a different perspective, that might be something like what is called the kind of pre-modern Sanskrit cosmopolis, this idea that Sanskrit as a kind of ancient language of South Asia um, spread beyond it and was a kind of key uh, to a key kind of um, linguistic world uh, in the age prior to, long prior to colonialism. We might think about other models like the early modern Persian world, where Persian becomes a lingua franca stretching um, from the Middle East all the way through um, to Southeast Asia. Um, an example might be something uh, I'm suggesting here, sort of more modern and contemporary Islamic connections, right? Connections forged um, in, in this case, in the religious context of, of Islam, um, connections that are not necessarily solely modern, but in fact have stretched back to, to Arabic and, and pre-modern Persian as we've talked about. Um, and here's a, a, there's a lovely example that I like to share that I'm sharing now of, um, of, a, of a link between Urdu and Indonesian, right? So um, the great, uh, the great Urdu singer Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan um, and his well-known song Allahu, um, which you can see the lyrics there on the, on the left, I think. Ye zameen jab na ti, ye jahan jab na ta, jahan da suraj na te, asaman jab na ta, raaz e haq bhi kisi par ayan jab na ta, tab na ta kuch jahan. So when there was nothing here, you here, you were here, you, the you being, being God. And this being then quite recently um, taken on by an Indonesian um, and hugely popular sort of Islamic pop group um, called um, Rehan uh, and their version where they sing both the Urdu and then they translate it into Indonesian and sing Jika Tiada Bumi, Tiada Sika La Enya, Bulan Matahari, Langit, Pun Tiada. So these little, um, examples of connections that speak to much more connected worlds than we might appreciate. And then of course there's that perhaps greatest um, example of South Asian culture and connections um, in Bollywood, in song and dance, in Hindi language cinema. Um, and again when we think about that as a kind of perhaps the most popular cultural product um, from India, from South Asia, um, we kind of think about it in, in, in isolated terms as something that is there. But um, again, we can see and we, we can look at this in the, in the degree as well, thinking about the way in which it travels, you know, not solely to cinemas um, where there are members of the diaspora, not solely um, to London, to Leicester, to places in, in, in India where there are in India, in um, the UK, where there are substantial kind of South Asian diaspora populations, but in fact, all over the world as part of those diasporas, but also as part of independent attempts to uh, include and enjoy different cultures. So for instance, um, you can see some images here on the right of, um, of uh, a variety of, of film posters from Ghana in the 1980s. And you can see, you know, Bollywood um, films featuring alongside adaptations of Hollywood and other kinds of uh, Nollywood, as we call it, productions um, in, in West Africa. Um, and again, there's a long history here that is really interesting to explore. And I was, in fact, um, decided at the very last minute to include a little image from tomorrow's uh, new film uh, coming out on Netflix, which is called Namaste Wahala or Hello Trouble, um, which is this kind of interracial love story with an, an Indian um, an Indian man and a, and a, and a Nigerian woman um, and we're, well, we're going to see tomorrow perhaps how that plays out um, but very much fated uh, as you can see in the news clips there as this Nollywood meets Bollywood in a love story on Netflix kind of moment. So these connections are always here to be um, pulled or taken um, to be looked at and that's very much the kind of prime feature of our degree program in BA languages and cultures and as we approach South Asia through it and I'm sure you've had a chance to kind of uh, examine the website and to look at um, 
the way in which that structure is laid out, but just very briefly, and there's other sessions later on today, um, if you're if you're registered for those as well, you know, we, we really try and lay out those foundations um, in the first and second year, right? Looking at these connections between um, Africa, the Middle East, South and Southeast Asia, um, through culture, through literature, uh, through cinema and film, and then through questions of language and decolonization, um, before building on that in the second year, right? Again, exploring these kind of key cultural texts um, of culture, of literature and of, of film, um, and to think through questions of connection and connectivity uh, and the world that we live in today. And to think particularly, you know, um, how these connections are not solely of the moment, um, but have long histories. And when we look at the world, as I've said, from places like South Asia, right? When we reorient our perspective, it can actually look quite different. Should you be doing the four-year version of the degree, you then get to spend your third year on a year abroad, right? Really focusing in on language um, and our kind of South Asia ones that relate to that are particularly in the Urdu and Sanskrit. And then in your final year, whether you take a year abroad or not, um, you can then start really focusing in on the regions that are of particular interest to you or maintaining the kind of diversity um, and comparative perspective that we, that we have introduced you in the years running up to that. Um, and as I said, yes, those are, those are the kind of languages um, we offer that deal with South Asia, including Persian, um, which has a you know, long-standing presence in South Asia that was taught by our colleagues in the near Middle East um, section. Um, and we also offer, um, uh, where feasible, courses on Bengali, Punjabi, Prakrit, and Tibetan, which all have connections, as I said, to the region. We offer them from the beginner's level right through to the year abroad and then to beyond. So by the time you're coming back from your third year, if you choose to take that option, um, you're really able to use these to quite a high level and engage with texts and uh, whether those are written or, or cinematic um, or something else. So that's it from me, a very brief and very sort of um, histy, if you like, a very sort of um, rushed overview of some of the things we can do uh, when, we, when we study South Asia, when we study um, this BA Languages and Cultures. I'm now going to pass over to my friend and colleague, Naresh Sharma, who's going to give you a little taste of what it's like to learn Hindi or Urdu. Naresh. Great, thank you. Thanks very much, David. Um, yes, I'm going to just spend a few minutes and um, cover a little short Hindi or Urdu language taste to review. And the idea is to um, just give you some background to these languages and um, we're going to be introducing some beginners level words and phrases and also just to give you a feel for the kind of things that we might be doing in a Hindi or Urdu language class. So um, I'll just get the slides started. While I'm just getting this technology to work for me, let me encourage you to interact and um, put some comments in the chat. So first of all, maybe you could just tell me which um, languages you already know what uh, languages you already speak, whether you already have some existing um, knowledge of, of Hindi and Urdu. So that would be uh, really useful for me to know. So, um, let's see. Yeah, please do, you know, type away. I don't see any any comments coming in yet, so I'll let you um, do that whilst I proceed. Um, first of all, I'm going to start off with this. Uh, the title of my presentation today is Milke um, Hushi Hui, and this is a phrase that means pleased to meet you. And um, so, as you know, I'm a Noresh Sharma senior lecturer in Urdu and Hindi, as David mentioned. And so this phrase, milke bari khushi hui, pleased to meet you. We, um, I'm not going to go into the grammar and the structure of how this works, but uh, it means something like having met great happiness happened. And so in the classroom, sometimes I, I, I like to offer some suggestions. Okay, how do we learn languages? How can we memorize words and phrases? And sometimes trying to build up some associations. So, this particular phrase, I've come up with a little sort of mnemonic and uh, mentioning something like Milky Bar. I don't know whether you ever um, are a fan of Milky Bar. I am not a particularly white chocolate fan myself. I prefer more the dark chocolate, but Milky Bar sort of sounds like Milky Bari to me. And then Kushi, ah, Kushi sort of reminds me of a 
a cushion, it's almost sounds the same. And then hui, what kind of association can we have with hui? Um, anything that you can think of? Well, there's Hui, who is um, the K-pop um, star from Pentagon. I don't know whether you follow Korean pop music, or maybe you watch um, Doctor Who. Uh, Who, Hui, some connection there. So this phrase, maybe you could imagine you are eating a milky bar, sitting on a cushion whilst you're watching or watching Doctor Who or listening to Hui. If you build that mental image, maybe it connects to this phrase, I don't know, try it, think about that. And um, move on to some greetings. Namaste, Salaam Alaikum, greetings that you might hear in um, Hindi and Urdu. And uh, also a phrase here for you, Mera Naam Naresha. And uh, Mera Naam Naresha, you see in Roman script, the translation, my name is Naresh. A question you might ask, first of all, is, okay, we're doing a Hindi and Urdu taster. How come we're having both of these languages together in one taster? The background, well, Hindi and Urdu are, um, at the spoken level, virtually identical. At the day-to-day -day colloquial level, we might have some differences in vocabulary and um, maybe not too dissimilar to British English and American English, where in Britain we might say uh, lift, whereas in the US they say elevator or pavement and sidewalk, things like that. We have different, um, different types of words, different words for, for the same thing. And um, similarly with Hindi and Urdu, at the day-to-day -day level, they are virtually identical. So this phrase, Mera Naam Naresha, you could say that in Hindi. Am I speaking Hindi or am I speaking Urdu? It's the same. The distinction comes when you see the written form. And here you can see the phrase, Mera Naam Naresha, written in Urdu, which is this sort of uh, modified Persian um, or Arabic script, and which is written from uh, right to left. And then in Hindi, we have the um, Hindi script, which we read from left to right in Devanagari, which is also what we use for Sanskrit, Marathi, various other languages. Um, so yes, at the day-to-day -day level, very similar. It's only when we get to sort of like literary or journalistic styles of language that uh, Hindi borrows more from Sanskrit and um, Urdu borrows more from Persian Arabic sources. And then look at the word nam, nam, name, you see these similarities between the actual words um, themselves. And um, agenda, so, um, well, we've already introduced, well, I've introduced myself, and um, this is what we're gonna be covering, not necessarily in this order, things might be, might be flowing sort of to and fro, but you still get a bit of a flavor. So as I said, Miranam Nareshe, and I'm gonna ask this question to you, and, I would say, Abka Nam Kya Hai. Abka Nam Kya Hai. Now, we're not going to have our mics on. We're not going to go into breakout rooms, but you can still repeat after me. You can still answer the questions whilst um, I'm asking you, you know, in the comfort of your own home. And I do say this to language students that even if you don't have anyone to practice with, you can talk to yourself. Um, it might be odd if, you know, you were getting the bus or the tube and talking to yourself, someone might give you weird looks, but uh, you know, when you're at home, particularly in lockdown, you can be talking to yourself and practicing the language. And right now I would encourage you to speak to your computer or speak to me through your computer with your mics off. And your answer would be whatever your name is. So let me ask you that and you answer. And I'm presuming you're telling me your name. And how about you ask me the question as well? So I'm imagining you're asking me, Abka Nam Kya Hai? Please do try that. Abka Nam Kya Hai? And then put that all together as a phrase, Abka Nam Kya Hai? Can I hear you? And my answer would be, Nera Nam Naresh Hai. And the phrase, please to meet you. Hey, what was that mnemonic that we had? What was that image that we had in our mind? Um, 
We're eating a milky bar, or sitting on a comfortable cushion, and we're either listening to Re or watching Doctor Who. Ah, milke bari hushi hui. Do you try that? Milke bari hushi hui. And so a little bit about our modules at SOAS. We'll go into a little bit more language shortly, but let me tell you about what we teach at SOAS. So we offer uh, language programs, language modules in Hindi and Urdu from beginner's level. So you don't need any background or any existing knowledge in Hindi or Urdu whatsoever. And then we go up into various levels. We have, um, you can see on the website, you can explore in more detail the type of things that we cover in each module. And we use various materials, textbooks here from beginners levels, learning the script, learning the language, grammar books, readers, etc. So um, quite a range of material. And um, obviously now with um, everything being online, um, loads of material, I post my material online, all of our classes are held online in the virtual classroom. Um, Hindi and Urdu, where are they spoken? I'm sure you know um, the main places where Hindi and Urdu are spoken, and that it is the Urdu is a national language, it's a national language of Pakistan, and both of these, um, Hindi and Urdu, are official languages of India, but also all around the world, wherever Hindi and Urdu um, speakers from the subcontinent have settled, Hindi and Urdu is spoken, and um, Certain regions as well have developed their own styles of Hindi. And for example, I'm coming to mind is Fiji and Hindi. So indentured workers who um, were taken from the subcontinent to Fiji, took the language with them. And in Fiji, you have this, um, this style of Hindi, its own distinct form, Fiji and Hindi. And then similarly as well in the, in the Caribbean, in places like Guyana, where um, indentured laborers once again were taken across the oceans and took their language. You have uh, styles of Urdu and Hindi spoken there as well. And in terms of speakers of the language, so in India alone, you can see from the um, 2011 census here that the number of um, Hindi speakers is close to 700 million. That is, wow, a lot of people. And Urdu, over 60 million, which um, interestingly is more than the number of Urdu speakers in Pakistan. And uh, could be an interesting discussion to talk about that another time. And um, just to compare with numbers of English speakers as well, you can see the stats here. Um, and in England as well, you see Urdu is up there with over a quarter million um, Urdu speakers. So um, could be a useful language to learn here you're um, probably not far from an Urdu speaker and um, could find opportunity to practice in person once this, these lockdown restrictions are over. A um, little bit about language families. Sometimes it's useful to, to think about how languages are connected. And that's why I was interested to know about what languages um, you speak, because um, we can see connections between languages and the fact that Hindi and Urdu are part of the Indo-European um, language family, which you can see illustrated to some extent on this slide. And you see Hindi and Urdu here in the Indic languages and uh, English down here in the Germanic languages and other languages that you might know you might find on this chart as well. So there are these links that occur between languages, which can be useful for language learning. Um, I like this slide in particular because you see the Indo-European word brother um, and how it has sort of the, the, the similarities with other words for brother across the continent. So in the Proto-Indo-European brother and how in the UK, in English, we have brother. And then um, in India, we've got bradra which um, in modern Hindi, bhai, modern Urdu, bhai as well. So you might see links and similarities between your um, languages that you know and uh, other, and, and Hindi and Urdu. And this um, little slide here, I, I tend to like to share as well, because you'll see a number of words here. And my question is, which of the following are Hindi and Urdu words? Which of these words have come to English from the Hindi and Urdu path. Um, 
I don't know if anyone wants to put anything in the chat. I would encourage you to, to interact with me through the chat and um, tell me which of these words you think are coming to English from Hindi and Urdu. So, um, well, let me tell you, in fact, they all are, interestingly, so all of these words have come across. And um, so that can be useful in, in uh, again, seeing connections, building vocabulary, words that we already know, and um, whilst we're learning the language. The script, we talked a little bit about the script. I mentioned that Hindi is written in Devanagari, which we also use in Sanskrit, the Marathi, Konkani, Nepali, and here's a slide just illustrating what the Hindi alphabet looks like. And then Urdu script is um, written in this modified form of uh, um, sort of an Arabic script. And on the issue of scripts and writing, here is a famous diary. And any thoughts on who could have written this diary, a historical figure? And at the bottom, there is a translation as well. Not the neatest of handwritings, if I am honest. This is in fact written by Queen Victoria, the Empress of India herself. She was given that title later in her reign. And um, I believe she had an affinity to India um, and wanted to learn Urdu, which was the official language at the time. This is her Urdu teacher, um, Abdul, and uh, you know, being an Urdu teacher myself, I am not taught any royalty as, as far as I'm aware, but hey, you know, that might change. I don't know if uh, Elizabeth II is interested in learning Urdu, probably not actually. Anyway, let's get started um, with a bit more speaking. We've already um, been talking about our names. You asked me my name, I told you my name, I asked you your name. Um, we can greet each other by saying Namaste or Asalaamu and then you can uh, respond with Namaste or Waalaikum Aslam. Kya hal hai? Try this phrase. Kya hal hai? Put that together. Kya hal hai? Which means how are you? And the response, Tik hai. It's fine. Shukriya. Tik hai. Shukriya. Okay, thanks. And you or up? Tike shukriya. And okay, thanks. Why have I got a little TK in here? It's because the actual word TK sounds a little by TK. So again, another way of maybe remembering it, TK, okay. TK shukriya. Okay, thanks. And um, so try these, try saying these phrases. Kya hal hai? Kya hal hai? TK shukriya. Now, if we had more time, if we were in um, breakout rooms or if we had our mics on, I'd go into a little bit more detail with the pronunciation. How do we say this teak? Because it's a very specific kind of T sound and it has this aspiration as well. Teak hair, shukriya. And then we have the phrase or up, or up. And we really roll our R's in. Um, in the end, Urdu or up, tike shukriya again. So, what was the phrase for the for asking our names? What's your name? Aapka naam kya hai? Aapka naam kya hai? Mera naam Naresh hai. So, the idea with language learning is lots of repetition, practicing, trying to build connections with words and phrases, and getting to that point where we, you know, it's automated, we can do it without thinking, and that takes practice, and that's what we do in the classroom, that's what I encourage students to do when I set homework as well. So, milke badi khushi hui, that was our phrase for pleased to meet you, and we can try and have a little bit of a conversation now. So, on the next um, slide, we'll see some words and phrases, I'll say them, and then you repeat after me. So um, with your audio mute, namaste or assalamu alaikum. And then the reply would be wa alaikum aslam, namaste. Kya hal hai? So try repeating that phrase, kya hal hai? Thik hai shukriya, thik hai shukriya. 
और आप क्या हाल है और आप क्या हाल है एंड यू हैव यू ठीक है शुक्रिया ठीक है ओके okay. शुक्रिया थैंक्स ठीक है शुक्रिया आपका नाम क्या है मेरा नाम नरेश है आपका नाम क्या है मेरा नाम नरेश है एंड यूर ऑफिसली से यू नेम दै मिल के बड़ी खुशी हुई मिल के बड़ी खुशी हुई एंड अ वेरी क्विक कॉन्वर्सेशन दिस टाइम यू आंसर यू यू रीड आउट द बिट्स इन ग्रीन सो असलम नमस्ते क्या हाल है ठीक है शुक्रिया सो आई एम इमेजिनिंग यू रीडिंग द बिट्स इन ग्रीन एंड आई एम आंसरिंग टू यू आपका नाम क्या है मेरा नाम नरेश है Milke, badi, khushi, hui. It's very strange doing this without your mics on. Usually in the classroom, obviously my students have their mics on, and I can hear them. We can interact with each other. But hey, um, grammar. Obviously, we need to couple our language learning with grammar. We might um, cover some terminology. So even if you haven't done grammar before, not to worry. We um, explain everything about grammar terms. and uh, nouns verbs adjectives etc don't go into anything in too much hardcore grammar uh, detail just the basics that we need to know and you'll see from this phrase for example mera naam nirish hai the word hai is so how in hindi and urdu is the word the verb goes at the end and aapka naam kya hai kya meaning what goes just in front of the verb so you, we can see word order and structure from very early on um, but it's not just all about um grammar rules in textbooks and things like that we might uh, look at a song and i might ask you to identify a particular grammatical forms in the song and here is a image of sushmita sen who song who sings this song in the film and she's uh, you know got her very stylish pp on there and we'll do practical activities such as role plays but we'll also look at the language um through the literature maybe um access some urdu poetry and here is an image of a an urdu verse written in a very um, beautiful calligraphic style maybe you know trying to analyze this what is this verse or looking at um print news as well as online news might take a look at some film posters and look at different type scripts so all sorts of things that we might do and um this actually brings me to the end of the presentation so we can have some questions um about either my presentation or david's presentation so i think i can stop sharing now and uh, open the floor up to you okay thank you both for that uh we've got received three questions in the q and a which uh, i'm hoping you guys will be fine to answer live So uh, I'll read the questions. I've had one question from oh four now. Uh, one question from Katerina, uh, which is, uh, do you think apps like Duolingo and the like can teach us to become proficient in a language? Right. I, to be honest, don't know what the ins and outs of Duolingo are. Um, so I, I'm not sure if I'm really well placed to answer that. I think um, from from what I've heard, you can pick up words and phrases, but. becoming proficient in a language i don't know personally i think you need to speak to people and uh, one of the best ways to build up proficiency is is interaction but also immersion so that's why i encourage students to do the the year abroad or we also have a summer abroad module to go to the country to be immersed in the country and to be interacting with um, you know in the urdu speakers and having in the urdu around you all the time sometimes we can create fake immersion in environments at home and by just watching the um, you know tv of um, the region uh, listening to the music of the region and and just having as much of it around you as possible um but yeah i'm not sure if you can just do it 
solely through through the app. Um, yeah, I'd, I would like to hear about your experience. So, Katerina, do drop me an email. I don't know if David, if you have anything to 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 say about that, since having you know studied languages as well, or for her being a you know a Korean language student. Anyone else has anything to be mentioned? Please. Um, I've actually tried Duolingo, oh. um, <laughs> um, but I feel that there's quite a lot of grammatical errors on it. And I feel like it's very, it's kind of like comparing it to Google Translate, like it doesn't translate exactly how you want it to. And um, so it teaches you wrong sometimes and the spelling is a bit off as well. So I wouldn't recommend it, honestly. Thanks. That's okay. I see the next question from Kishford that you're a mature student and uh, you can speak a little bit of Urdu um right yes uh we do have students who come who already have some prior language knowledge and um we have different levels available so it'd probably be about having a conversation and assessing your your language level so i always try and meet students before uh, they enroll on a particular module and now that everything is online, it's just a lot more convenient to be able to set up a quick, you know, Zoom chat and, and, and assess your level and then, you know, advise more specifically. But um, if you have some prior knowledge, then yes, you know, we, we have different levels. So if, if we have a level that's suited to you, then um, yeah, more than happy to talk about that. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, what is the difference between Shukriya and Danyavad from Katrina? Sure. I, I don't know, David, would you like to take this as, as... I could try and take this and we might take it um, with the next one, which is from a, an anonymous uh, attendee and take them together. How different are Urdu, Hindi and Hindustani grammatically? Um, I mean, the difference between Shukriya and Danyavad is where they're from. So you remember Naresh said that in certain contexts, Urdu and Hindi start to differentiate themselves by the kind of vocabulary that they draw on um, in particularly at higher registers, right? If you're going to talk about science or you're going to talk about religion or literature, um, you start picking, you know, choosing your words. Do you say napkin or serviette? You know, do you take the the the, the, the Anglo-Saxon word or do you take the kind of French derived, Norman French derived uh, word? Um, so do you, do you say shukriya, which comes ultimately from, from Arabic, shukran? Um, or do you use danyavad, uh, which has a more kind of what we say Indic or, or kind of Sanskritic um, origin. Um, they mean the same thing when we translate them um, and they are, you know, fundamentally interchangeable, though they do indicate, you know, what kind of register you're speaking. Um, and then this question about grammar, Hindi, Urdu and Hindustani. This Hindustani is a word that I'm particularly um, familiar with. My whole PhD was on this idea of Hindustani as a kind of space of common ground, you know, it, at a time under colonialism when Hindi was becoming associated with Hindu and Urdu was becoming associated with Muslim. Um, there were lots of people who wanted to say, that's not how we think of language and that's not how we think of literature and that's not how we think of religion. Hindustani, there's a very famous line from, um, uh, oh my goodness, um, Iqbal, um, Hindi hai hum vatan hai Hindustan, vatan, oh my goodness. Mazhab nahi sakata aapas mein beher rakna, Hindi hai hum vatan hai Hindustan hamara. So we are Hindi, we are Indian, right? So these words all have different meanings. On the basic question of grammar, there is no difference. They share a grammar. Um, you might look at one grammatical feature, which would be the azafat, which I suppose doesn't get used in, in Hindi. Um, but fundamentally, this is a shared grammar across these registers. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to ask uh, if there's any questions, please ask them now. I'll wait for about 20 seconds. Well, maybe we should just say, um, you know, if there are no questions or if no one uh, wants to raise their hand, we can at least say that, you know, we're all very happy to be contacted with any questions you have. So you can write to Naresh and you can write to me. Um, and if you, if you want to know anything more about studying South Asia at SOAS or the degree in particular, um, we're always happy to get those emails. Um, so do feel free to get in touch with us. That it? That's it. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. I think, I'm, I'm not sure there's any more questions. Oh, oh. oh we got one. So, uh, 
Yeah, so can I say religion makes most of the differences between Hindi and Urdu? Yeah, to a point. Um, they, in a kind of contemporary sense, in a recent historical sense, as I was saying, you know, they do get associated with different religious communities. And some people are invested in, in kind of weaponizing that difference um, as they were historically from, you know, the 19th century on. And others are interested in, in not doing that. So religion is a component of it. Um, but there are, you know, different literary traditions as well um, that overlap for some people, but remain quite separate for others. Um, there are different kind of aesthetic worlds. Um, so religion is a part of it, um, but religion itself um, isn't to blame. You know, it's the, it's the choices that people make um, and the associations they want to make with, with language. Um, I'm not sure if that's an entirely clear answer, but um, it's a complicated question. So, Great. Okay, well, I'm afraid we're out of time. So I guess all that's left to do is to thank, uh, to thank Farah. But, oh, do we have time for one more question? It's, uh, I think we can get that in. What, what sort of career path would this degree help with? No. So, um, so many different career options. We've had students who have done um, South Asian studies with um, language and have gone into all sorts of things from, you know, journalism to working for, um, you know, within the charity sector, within diplomacy. Um, you know, you name it, because it's 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 quite a sort of like a, you know, this interdisciplinary de degree that um, you know David was explaining about. So it opens up a lot of pathways. Um, I don't think there is one set kind of you know direction that our students tend to go into. Yeah, it's 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 you know it's very vast indeed. Um, I don't know if, if David, you've got any thoughts on that as well from. Previous, say, previous students that you've known. I'll say two things quickly. Um, I was having a conversation just the other day uh, where um, a friend of mine in business was saying that, you know, the place that most area studies or like, you know, language studies graduates go to is investment banking, um, which I thought was terribly sad. But, um, you know, it's because, you know, the, the banks want people who know um, parts of the world and, and know how to speak to people there and know how to interact with them. And that kind of cultural knowledge is really valuable. And um, similarly, you know, every year after year, the, the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry says, we are concerned that there aren't enough people graduating of languages. And we are concerned that there aren't as many courses as there used to be because businesses love language. So whether you want to, and love language graduates because language graduates demonstrate this kind of commitment um, over multiple years to learning something that really takes time and effort. Um, and they come out with a kind of, as I've said, different way of seeing the world. Um, so your options are wide open when you take a degree like this. Great. Okay. So now we really are out of time. So uh, thank you, Farah, for helping us out. And of course, thank you to Naresh and David for giving this great talk. And of course, thank you for our attendees for joining us today. I uh, hope you enjoyed and have a great day. Thank you, Aman. Thank you. Same to you. Bye-bye.